Yes, we are live now. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce you to Diana Mastracci Sanchez, our next uh, keynote speaker. Um, Diana will speak about indigenous hackathons, leveraging open EO data and tools for climate action. What can we learn from indigenous innovations? Diana is passionate about finding creative ways to maximize the impact of current technologies to empower social change initiatives. She has co-created several innovative hackathons and citizen science projects with indigenous youth, elders and scientists at the intersection of traditional and scientific knowledge. She has worked with Inupiaq whaling captains in the Alaskan Arctic to indigenous shore leaders from the Ecuadorian Amazon. Wow, like everywhere in the world. She is the founder of Space for Innovation, a consulting firm that uses space assets and open innovation to co-design culturally relevant solutions to the climate change crisis. She is a social anthropologist by training with a master science uh, in with a master in science specializing in remote sensing and GIS from the University of Oxford. She has worked at the European Space Agency, uh, at NASA and the University of, of Oxford, the Citizen Cyber Lab, and was also a visiting scholar at the Cartographic Research Center at Carleton University. She currently works as a consultant for the group on Earth Observation and is in the International Strategic Liaison of the Geo-Indigenous Alliance. Okay, Diana, the floor is yours. Welcome to our conference. Thank you very much, Veronica. And my name is uh, Diana Nauriak Mastracci Sanchez, and it's uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, today at this conference and um, on indigenous innovation. I was actually born in Venezuela, but raised in Africa, Central America, and Europe. And uh, my grandparents actually met while studying at university in La Plata in Argentina. So I'm really honored to be speaking to you today at Phosphor G, Buenos Aires. And uh, there is a reason for my uh, middle name, Nauriak, which was given to me by uh, Arnold Brower Jr., who is an Inupiaq sea ice expert from the Alaskan Arctic. Um, so in 2014, I traveled for the first time to the uh, Alaskan Arctic to investigate how information communication technologies could be used by Inupiaq sea ice experts to adapt to the new ice regime uh, caused by the changes in climate, and as well to conduct a live usability study of an existing citizen science app. Um, the Inupiaq community lives in the north slope of Alaska, which is that red part on the, on the map on the left-hand side, and it's the northern, northernmost part in the, in the US. You can't get any further north uh, than that in the Americas. And um, they are a subsistent community, and they rely on uh, sea ice for its livelihood. And uh, the sea ice is a type of ice that attaches to the shore and, uh, in the fall and breaks out in, uh, during the springtime. Uh, so I shadowed the Inupiaq hunters out on the sea ice and conducted interviews on the ice to understand what kind of technology uh, they were using to safely navigate on the ice and to find out if they would be interested in using an existing citizen science app to collect in situ data of the ice to better understand the new ice dynamics. But every time I talked to a hunter and uh, showed them the app and the radar images of the ice, the um, all told me the same thing. It's like, oh, cool. But uh, who you should really be talking to is uh, our students. While we are out here on the ice, they are in school and they're missing the opportunity to study the sea ice formation, which coincides with their school year. As um, mentioned earlier, the ice forms, starts attaching to the shore in the fall and breaks out in the spring. Um, they also told me that, uh, that it should be their own kids who um, should be designing their 
uh, own applications. And the data is very useful, but uh, it's important to remember that it's the land of the polar bear and temperatures drop down to minus 50 degrees Celsius. And you can't rely on technology alone as technology will eventually die on you. And um, they really wanted their children to, uh, their youth to both be able to interpret Earth's observation data uh, with their indigenous knowledge, as that was the only way uh, for them to navigate safely on, uh, on the dangerous ice. And that was one of the first lessons I learned that data and technology are useless without civic engagement and an understanding of the environment and local context. Uh, so I took their advice and visited the local school. I talked to students as well as elders and educators, and um, they all wanted their students to have a foothold in both their traditional knowledge and modern scientific world. And uh, they were very interested in creating an app um, for their students to share in situ uh, weather information when they were out on the ice, as, uh, such as um, wind speed and wind direction and uh, temperature with both their uh, elders and with uh, their peers. But there were no guidelines on how to co-design software uh, with and for indigenous communities. And um, so we decided to create some pilot projects and uh, to try to understand what were the real needs of the communities. Um, one of the projects was a youth directed movie on climate change. And uh, we had the elders, uh, the, the youth, sorry, interview their elders to understand what were um, the impacts that they were um, experiencing in their, um, in the sea ice. And, um, we had a pilot citizen uh, science uh, project in which we had high school students take um, in situ uh, measurements with uh, pocket weather meters and uh, whilst they were out on the ice and they shared that information with scientists at NASA, with their uh, whaling captains, uh, with their elders, as well as with their peers. Um, we had several um, um, projects in which the uh, the youth um, would uh, were connected with uh, some scientists, and um, they were sharing their own uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, of the sea ice. And um, finally, in 2014, we had um, our first uh, hackathon, Arctic Science, in uh, collaboration with the Ilasavik College, the Mobile Collective, and the Inupiaq Elders. And here is really where the indigenous methodology to co-design software with and for indigenous people was finally uh, born. And um, there, um, there was a need uh, to increase the intergenerational knowledge transfer because that's how knowledge is transferred in indigenous communities from elders to the youth. And um, the method also had to increase cross-cultural communication, uh, especially between um, scientists and um, students, and to instill a sense of pride uh, in the youth on their uh, local culture. Uh, so how do these uh, hackathons work? Uh, well, they're divided into three phases. Uh, in the first phase, we usually run a pre-hack in which the indigenous youth, they consult with their elders to come up with challenges that are locally relevant and that could be solved using Earth observation data. Uh, once the challenges are ready, they become part of the uh, final hack, which can take place both locally or um, uh, globally. And uh, throughout the process, the participants are mentored on um, by experts in remote sensing, indigenous knowledge, technology development. And um, after the event in the phase three, we mentor the winning team to assure that the winning solution is co-designed uh, with and for um, the community. And uh, we have been, uh, so the audience who we work with uh, different uh, various indigenous communities and uh, we invite everyone to participate in these hackathons from artists to scientists to programmers and um, the geo community has been uh, key in the past years 
And uh, so we started our first hack in 2014. Then we had the CIS app uh, with NASA in 2016. And every year since then, we've had uh, an indigenous hackathon. And uh, during uh, Geo Week in 2019, um, after the event, the um, Geo Indigenous Alliance was formed. And uh, the Geo Indigenous Alliance uh, is a network of indigenous um, people from around the world who are committed to empower indigenous communities to access and use uh, Earth observation data and tools within a cultural context. And um, so this is the team behind the Geo Indigenous Alliance. We have uh, Titus Letapo uh, from the Samburu tribe in Kenya, uh, Crichton Glenn uh, from um, Australia, James Ratcliffe Leaf Sr. Uh, from the Rosewood Sioux tribe, and uh, Mario Vargas Shakaim from the Ecuadorian Amazon. And one of the reasons why it's very important uh, to work um, with indigenous people is because indigenous people have been conserving biodiversity for millennia, living in harmony with nature. And they are currently conserving more than 80% of worldwide biodiversity, even though they are less than 10% of the world population. Um, through their traditional econo ecological knowledge, they are um, helping us to conserve the world's biodiversity. And they're currently facing many challenges uh, in accessing and using Earth observation data and tools from lack of uh, internet access. Many of these communities are extremely remote uh, to lack of electricity and the lack of opportunities to, um, to study um, in... Um, And uh, one of the uh, core pathways of the Indigenous Alliance is, the, um, is to increase the participation of Indigenous youth and women in Earth observations. And we'll soon be launching the Indigenous Youth Ambassador Program, and with the aim to develop a pool of positive uh, role models of Indigenous um, youth grounded in their own cultural values, and um, who will act as positive role models and provide them with personal and academic support and inspire the next generation of indigenous uh, youth uh, to utilize geotechnologies. So we are really interested in a paradigm shift in seeing indigenous youth as innovative contributors to the climate change crisis uh, through the use of their traditional knowledge and uh, earth observation data. Uh, so how can the phosphor G community help? Um, well, you can support the G Indigenous Youth Ambas Ambassador Program by being mentors, and uh, you can advocate for the uh, CARE Principle for Indigenous Data Governments, which were developed by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance in 2019 uh, to complement the FAIR uh, principles. Um, and you can help us to uh, advocate to close the digital divide, which is a huge issue. And... Um, these are three things that uh, indigenous people uh, have taught me about innovation. Um, that it's important to incorporate uh, different ways of knowing. A holistic view is key. Um, it's important to think about the impact of technology on, on both the current and future gener generation. Um, always think what is the legacy uh, you're going to leave behind. and. Um, and connecting research to concrete, to concrete local problems um, connected uh, to the environment, to the local environment. Uh, we need dynamic, uh, holistic, and uh, adaptive solutions, and we cannot afford to look at the world uh, from just one angle. Uh, we really need to work together, and all voices uh, must be heard to turn data into useful and uh, uh, meaningful uh, action. Um, and I invite you to join our indigenous uh, hackathon. Uh, please note that the date we have uh, extended the deadline to October 3rd. It's going to start tomorrow. And the challenges of the hackathon are being co-designed by different uh, indigenous people from around the world. And they will be revealed uh, tomorrow during the opening ceremony. And the aim of the hack is to increase awareness of indigenous people's specific data needs and priorities and promoting the use of Earth observation data among indigenous communities. 
and improving cross-cultural communication between the uh, local communities, programmers, and data providers, and uh, the phosphor community. Um, so we have some uh, really interesting workshops as well lined up for the hackathon if you want to join. Um, we have a uh, workshop uh, on how to access and use uh, planet data, on a workshop on how to utilize this uh, CEPAL uh, platform by FAO, and um, a workshop on the Brazilian data cube, and as well, obviously, a workshop on how to engage uh, and work with indigenous communities. Um, so I invite you to please get in touch and um, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, so everyone, there you have uh, Diana's contact information and Twitter. Follow her for updates. <laughs> um, and we have some questions from the audience that I will bring to you. Um, you are getting a lot of applauses. <laughs> um, so one of the questions, um, how do you deal with the lack of electricity and internet when you are carrying out these hackathons and designing um, these apps uh, that will serve some need of indigenous people? Uh. Well, we always, the, the challenges are co-designed by the uh, indigenous uh, communities. And um, so they know which part of their community has access to internet and which doesn't. And um, as well as um, there is always the, uh, it, it's very important to include the, um, an, an option to uh, download information uh, on the phone and to, um, um, to have as little data uh, transmitted as possible. Um, but all these uh, considerations are taken into account. Meanwhile, we co-design the challenges with the indigenous people. And um, yeah. OK, great. Um, it is really impressive uh, what you do there. I cannot imagine like designing things in the middle of the Arctic and with polar bears around and such. It's, it's really great. Um, so other question, uh, one of the most voted here is, how can non-developers contribute to the hackathon? Um, as, as I mentioned, one of the things I learned from working with indigenous people is that you need to include as many different voices as possible. So everybody has a different perspective. And um, an artist, for example, will have a, a design um, element that a software developer might not. And um, so we always encourage absolutely everyone to, um, to join. And um, the more diversity, the better. OK, everyone has a voice. That's nice. Um, Wait, let me see. Wow. OK, we are getting a lot of questions. <laughs> um, what are the biggest cultural challenges uh, you have or you face when working with indigenous uh, communities? Um, probably one of the biggest uh, challenge I faced was uh, accepting how um, scientists still do not, uh, some scientists still have a hard time to uh, accept indigenous knowledge as another way of uh, seeing the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, as I was working with the communities as a scientist, I was, um, uh, that was really hard on me. And um, there is still a lot that we need to do uh, in order to, um, to accept uh, indigenous knowledge as a um, the powerful uh, and um, 
the powerful uh, repository of, uh, of uh, knowledge that can help us to, uh, to, uh, to overcome all the challenges that we're facing right now with climate change. Mm. Indeed. We need to value th that kind of, that source of knowledge as well. Um, what kind of uh, software do they use? Uh, well, it depends. Like some of the uh, indigenous communities I worked with, they were um, super high tech and, um, you know, they were using um, uh, QGIS and they were had all the latest uh, smartphones and latest technologies. And then other communities, they were making their own maps with a, uh, with a pen and paper and um, so it, it really, it, it varies a lot. Okay. Um, are you collaborating with other organizations like community mappers, like, like from Nisera, for example, in the previous talk or youth mappers? No, not yet. And uh, we hope that uh, we are we're really looking forward to this uh, uh, hackathon tomorrow to try to engage with the phosphorus community because we know that there is really an untapped pool of uh, talent out there that um, we really want to collaborate with. Good. Yes. So uh, this leads me to another question, like what can, kind of challenges are expected during the hackathon? Like just an example. Just, uh, <laughs> All the challenges are locally relevant. So there are challenges that the communities are facing. And um, yeah, that's all I can tell you. I shared <laughs> yesterday the of the indigenous people who submitted their challenges. So we have some from the Amazon. Uh, we have some um, from Kenya and from North America. That's all I can say today. <laughs> Okay, so at least geographically, those are the places. <laughs> um, another one is, awareness goes through the knowledge of the past. Do you have knowledge of data sets and data sources regarding the past of indigenous communities? Um, so uh, indigenous communities, they've been recording their uh, their environment for millennia. And for example, the Inupiaq uh, subsistence hunters, when they go out on the sea ice, they take a, uh, they have a little notebook where they take all the information about uh, wind speed and wind direction. And they have like a really long record of um, how the ice has changed over time over these years. And, um, and now of course, because they're traveling with their smartphones, they can have like geographically accurate uh, in situ information. But um, to uh, successfully um, hunt out on the ice, for example, you really need to uh, take into consideration so many environmental variables and to keep a record as well. And before going out on the ice, you assess the, the current information with how it was previously, maybe the year before on that same date. So they are really like, um, masters in keeping uh, uh, in situ observations of their environment. Yeah, that's impressive. Is there um, any initiative to digitize all this information? Uh, I Are think you there aware? was, um, and the school was, um, um, the, the school I worked with up in the North Slope, they were interested in doing that. I don't remember if they um, followed up, but, um, yeah, it's definitely something uh, very important, especially for uh, their, uh, for everyone, not only for the the local community, but for the because um, uh, what happens in the Arctic affects everyone else as well. Yeah, so, indeed. I, I'm thinking like in terms of research and um, people doing research on that data, and then bringing back what Niseda was telling you, telling us before about this data colonialism. So I'm trying to kind of link everything. So if there could be more research with this data and then 
these results would be brought back to them, maybe it would enrich everyone, no? Yeah, obviously, the, the key is always to uh, to co-design all these projects with the community to ensure that they are uh, culturally relevant and that, um, yeah. Um, so more questions, there's a lot. Um, do we, I mean, people in general have access or can view this CIs app that you were talking about? Um, so uh, that CIs app, we ended up uh, doing a challenge for one of the NASA space apps uh, hack uh, hackathons. And I think we received something like a um, hundred different um, solutions. Um, the community after did not, um, all, all these solutions are online and they're open and uh, you, you can see them. Remember there was uh, the one that st struck me the most, there was a community, some students, I think they were from Bangladesh who had developed a, um, a rover to go on the ice so that the rover would go before the hunter and they would collect all this incident information. And uh, also it was, um, I, I think if you just uh, Google CI's app, NASA Challenge, you will see all the solutions there online. And uh, it, it was interesting to see that most of the people that answered the challenge were coming from very different parts of the world. We had from Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, um, places in Africa, and... Um, yeah, like and nothing to do with ice. <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with ice. <laughs> cool. Um, is, is language a problem when in this kind of projects? How do you handle that when you go there? Um, well, with the Inupia community, they're all uh, fluent in English, so that was not a problem at all. And then uh, with the communities that work in Latin America, they speak Spanish. But um, so far, I've always uh, worked with communities that uh, spoke a language that I was comfortable with. But um, otherwise, it's, it's important to work with a local translator, of course. Yes, right. Um, and where can people find more information about um, what you do about this project and the work with indigenous communities? You can, um, so the Indigenous Alliance, uh, we had um, a summit last year and we wrote a report which is online. If you Google Indigenous Alliance, um, the report is online. Um, and um, for the hackathons, if you uh, Google Space for Innovation, and um, you should have a, li a list of the hackathons there. Okay, so then we can post a link or something. Yes. I, I in any case, the chat afterwards. Yes, and in any case, if they follow your Twitter account, I think everything was in your Twitter as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have, so I don't have any further questions. I think I went through all of them. Ah, no. Um, are the results of the hackathon going to be published then with the free license? Uh, yes. And um, and the idea is that the uh, we will uh, work with the winning team so that they uh, turn their prototype into uh, a solution together with the community. Uh, so it's, it's a real co-design process. Uh, yeah. Last year, it took uh, a year <laughs> to finalize the, the, the applications, but um, usually all the people who uh, sign up to these uh, challenges, they are very committed and um, they are very eager to work with the indigenous community as well. Mm -hmm. And do you get then feedback from the indigenous communities on how they use uh, these these apps that you provide or these solutions that you build together? I'm in contact. I'm in constant contact with the communities, and uh, um, so some of the apps are still ongoing. Other apps, instead, it was the process itself that was useful for the community of having the youth involved in uh, um, in um, creating these challenges with their elders. Uh, so sometimes it's not about the actual uh, final app, but the, the whole process, it's, uh, it's very, um, they see a lot of value in the whole process. Okay. 
sometimes students end up going to university to study engineering or software development. And, uh, okay, so it goes much farther than just getting an app. Yeah. But, but building more. Okay. Um, okay. New questions. <laughs> Um, are all the prototypes published as FOSS, as FOSS like free and open source software? Uh, the ones that uh, have been finalized, they should be in GitHub, yes. Okay. Where can people find that info? Is Geo Hub, GitHub or? Mm, we actually, we should create one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But uh, I will post the information after on the chat. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, let me check. Yeah, I think I covered everything. Okay, do you have any other comment you would like to make? Or call or invitation? Well, I... I'm really glad to have this opportunity to speak to the FOS4G uh, community and uh, I really hope to establish a, um, a relationship uh, with all of you and to uh, really uh, tap into all your skills and um, invite you to, to work with us and with the indigenous communities. This is uh, really a, a fantastic opportunity and um, please join the, the hackathon tomorrow and sign up if you haven't. And, um, Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Diana. You are getting a lot of applause and hearts. <laughs> so we invite everyone then who is interested to join the hackathon, um, participate and search for more info, uh, subscribing to the different channels and contact uh, with you. Uh, we will finalize then the broadcast here and we meet you all in the afternoon sessions starting at 2 p.m. Argentinian time. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks to you. Thank you.